2 Peter 3, verse 1, and we'll read to verse 13. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray together. Father, we've just uh, sung together that your Holy Spirit still speaks today, and we know that your Spirit speaks whenever your word is read. We pray that as your Holy Spirit speaks to us your words, you would help us to listen to you. Help me to say only what's here and not my own thoughts. And we pray that you'd help us all to humbly submit ourselves to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is the next big date on your calendar? Uh, many of us uh, will have moved to digital calendars uh, these days, particularly for the everyday things that we need to remember. But in some of our homes, we may still have a paper calendar hanging up somewhere. Uh, and often those larger um, paper calendars are for the really uh, big dates in the diary, aren't they? They're for uh, wedding anniversaries or significant birthdays, maybe for a doctor's appointment. And for the really, really big dates in the calendar, uh, we might take steps to make sure that we don't forget. Uh, write them in uh, bright red pen, uh, put a circle around them, use a highlighter. It's too important. We mustn't forget. What is the next big date on God's calendar? Uh, last week, we celebrated the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It was quickly followed by uh, the ascension of the Lord to heaven, where today he rules as king, as his good news is proclaimed to every nation on earth. And the next great date is his glorious return. And if that date is uh, written, if you like, in red pen and circled and highlighted, it's not because the Lord might forget, but because we might. You notice how chapter 3 begins. Verse 1, have a look. Now, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. So they do already know this. You know, he's saying, you know that the Lord is coming back, but, but I want you to remember it. That, that is, I want you to move it from the back of your mind, at the back of your mental filing cabinet, and push it right to the front. Let it guide your decision-making. Live ready. And this morning, we're going to remember that the Lord Jesus will return. 
and we'll find out together what it means to be ready for it. We'll begin, though, with the headline here. Firstly, verses 1 to 7, remember God's promise, he will come. Remember God's promise, he will come. Now, the idea of the day of the Lord runs uh, all the way through the Bible. It's there in the Old Testament, not, a, not an apostolic invention. It was there all the way through. Long before Jesus came, the prophets uh, promised that a momentous day was coming for all mankind. And so Isaiah chapter 2, the Lord of hosts has a day. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Or Joel 2, the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? The Lord was going to come, and he would bring with him both judgment and salvation. This is the day still to come that Peter describes here. And the language he uses, did you notice, is deliberately cosmic and dramatic. It's like something from a a blockbuster movie. A look at 3 verse 12. It talks about the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, they'll melt. Now, come, uh, come summertime, Richmond is deluged with visitors, and the ice cream industry around here booms. And um, ice cream is a great and terrible choice, isn't it, for a hot summer's day? It's, it's great because it's really refreshing, but it melts so quickly. And before you know it, you've got chocolate ice cream running all the way down to your elbow. Now, when the day of the Lord comes, In judgment and salvation, says Peter, when he comes to wrap up human history, this phase of it, it will be so momentous, so dramatic, that the heavenly bodies, that the stars and the planets will melt like ice cream on a summer's day. The world as we know it today will be changed completely. And the Lord Almighty will sit in his throne of judgment on the human race. This is the next great date on God's calendar. Now, Peter wrote this letter just a few years after the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. It would have been, in some respects, fresh in the memory. But but already, it seems, there were skeptics when it came to the day of the Lord and the return of Christ. He quotes them there. Did you see that? Verse 4, in a mocking tone. Where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, say these skeptics, this all seems incredibly unlikely. Is God really going to return and wrap up human history and judge the human race? Is he really going to melt the elements like wax? Will he really roll up the sky like a scroll, burn the cosmos and make a new one? Doesn't the world just keep ticking over? Hasn't it been running unchanged from the very beginning? Now, did you notice that these skeptics are not genuine truth seekers? So verse 3 They follow their own sinful desires. In other words, they they believe whatever will let them keep on living however they like. And the thought of a day of judgment to come, a day of reckoning, is is deeply inconvenient. It it suits them to deny it. And look at verse 5. They, says Peter, deliberately overlook the evidence for Jesus' return. We live, don't we, in a culture that laughs at the idea of a day of judgment. And we need to remember there's a reason for that. Even so, we might share their skepticism. Even if we are Christians, I wonder, do we find the idea of the day of the Lord easy to believe? The dissolving of the elements, do you find that easy to believe? Or or does the world, the way it is now, feel permanent, solid, lasting? I mean, in your mind's eye, uh, look up to the heavens. Is the planet Jupiter really one day going to vanish with a roar? Is the giant burning sun going to be swallowed up by the glory of the Lord? Can we really believe in something so dramatic, so completely cosmos changing? What if we find the idea of a massive creation shaking event like this hard to believe? Peter would say to us, Have you forgotten the flood? Have you forgotten the flood? The point of verses five to six there is that God has done something like this before. The same God who parted the waters at creation, he, he separated the water in the air from the water in the sea, later deluged the world under water in a flood. We read about it earlier in Genesis 6 and 7. And the flood was devastating. The waters rose so high, even the, the mountain tops were underwater. All flesh 
we read. All flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures, all apart from Noah and his family, all mankind. Utterly devastating. It's, it so reshaped the world that the aftermath described in Genesis 6 deliberately echoes the account of creation in Genesis 1, as if to say this is now a, a whole new start for planet Earth. It's like this is a different world. You hear what Peter's saying? He's saying God's done it before. He's reshaped, he's reset the world before. And he's going to do it again, just as he promised. Did you notice several times Peter talks about God's promise? There in verse 4, there again verse 9, and then again verse 13. Ultimately, what these scoffers are doubting is, is God's promise or God's word. At the world in which they live, they treat that as solid and lasting and permanent, but God's promise, God's word, they treat as temporary and passing and unreliable. But they've got things exactly the wrong way around. Notice that, verse 5. How did this world come to exist in the first place? Verse 5. God created the world by the word of God. What came first? The world around us or the Word of God? The Word of God came first. When it comes to this world and everything that happens in it, God's Word is in charge. God's Word is the conductor of the orchestra, if you like, the driver of the bus, the, the king. And without God's Word, there would be no world at all. And this world only continues because of the Word of God. So in, in Hebrews 1 verse 3, for example, we learn that the Son, that the Lord Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. In other words, in a mysterious and wonderful way, the world keeps on turning because Jesus keeps on telling it to turn. His, his voice, his word of command is keeping the planets orbiting and the rain falling. You remember the story of Jesus calming the storm. He speaks and it obeys. But the point is that wasn't a one-off. Jesus keeps on speaking and the world keeps on obeying. A creation obeys the voice of Jesus the way a, a sheepdog obeys the voice of a farmer. Jesus speaks and the earth turns. Jesus speaks and the clouds gather or drift. Jesus speaks and the mountains stand and the, and the oceans roll. And the laws of physics are constant and predictable because God's word tells them to be. Now, if God so decided that the chair underneath you could turn into jelly, uh, you, could, uh, uh, you could kick a football and instead of the ball dipping under the crossbar and into the goal, it would fly straight up into the air and keep going into outer space. God's word began and it sustains and governs God's world. It obeys his command. From the big, biggest planet in the, in, the, in the universe to the tiniest subatomic particle, creation relies on the word of God. So when God says that a day is coming when, verse 7, by that same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly, we know it will certainly happen. His word determines reality. His word is more ultimate, more solid, more permanent than the world itself. Remember his promise. He will come. Okay, but why, why the delay? That second, verses 8 to 10, understand God's patience. He wants you to repent. Understand God's patience. He wants you to repent. In verses 8 to 10, Peter turns to the elephant in the room. Why the long delay? Now, already in the first century, as he wrote, there had been a long delay since the promises of the ancient prophets. Now, Isaiah had predicted the day of the Lord some seven to 800 years earlier, and the delay today, of course, is all the longer. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus told his apostles that he was coming soon, and, and some skeptics today think that this undermines everything Jesus said. 
He, he said he'd return soon, and he hasn't, so he's a fraud. Have those skeptics read 2 Peter 3, I wonder? Verse 8. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In other words, God's perception of time is different from ours. What seems a long time to us is a short time to him. Uh, on a far smaller level, we see this played out in families regularly. So, uh, you know, the family are in the car, they're driving somewhere, it's about an hour's drive. And the family have been on the road for all of about 15 minutes. And up pipes little Alfie in the back. What does he say? Are we nearly there yet? And for a toddler in the, in the back seat of the car, time can really drag. And to the adults, 15 minutes, even an hour, isn't really very much. Now, if even our own perception of time can differ from human to human and change as we get older, perhaps, how much more with the Lord? The Ancient of Days, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You remember how the Bible begins? In the beginning, God. Before the beginning of the world, perhaps before the beginning of time itself, God is. We'll take Psalm 90, a psalm I think Peter probably had in his mind as he wrote this verse. Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, the Lord Jesus makes this mind-melting statement in John 8. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. As though to the Son of God, the past is as the present, as though he's, he's outside of time, able to look at the whole of time the way we might look at a, a meter ruler. He is past, present, and future all at once. He always is. And so, of course, his experience of time is not the same as ours is. To, to him, a thousand years might as well be like a day, and a day like a thousand years. Uh, to us, it's been uh, 2,000 years and counting since Christ ascended, but to the Lord, perhaps a couple of days. If the resurrection happened on Sunday, it's Tuesday today. So to call this a long delay, says Peter, really depends on how you look at it, which is worth remembering, isn't it, the next time it seems that God is dragging his feet with us. But still, from our perspective, it is a delay. So why the delay? And the answer is simple, verse 9. It's his patience. His patience, verse 9, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I have to apologize for mentioning, mentioning school again. I'm sorry, if you're loving the Easter holidays and desperate not to go back to school, please forgive me. But um, when I was at school... Uh, sometimes a teacher would set, up, set us some work to do, and the teacher would nip off to go and get a coffee from the staff room. And they'd promise us that they were coming back, right? And of course, we would use that as an excuse to muck about. We'd throw things at each other. We'd make a mess. Now, imagine that the teacher comes back down the corridor, and they hear the commotion. Now, what do they do? Well, they have at least two options, don't they? They can burst in and start handing out uh, detentions, like throwing them like confetti, or... Or they can decide to wait outside. They can wait, maybe even send someone else in to warn the boys to sort themselves out. I was at an all-boys school. Send someone else to warn the boys to sort themselves out, give them a chance to settle down, tidy up the mess, and get back to their work, so that the teacher can then walk in and find them, well, to use the language of the passage, repentant. Now, it's a completely flawed picture. Of course it is. Uh, the Lord hasn't gone to the staff room. <laughs> and he's well aware of everything happening in, in this world and in your life right now. But his delay is his patience with you. He's giving us a chance to repent. If you're uh, not a Christian this morning, you do need to see this very clearly. 
It may be that uh, this talk of a day of judgment sh sounds harsh and hard. But maybe you struggle with the idea that one day God will call you to account for the way that you've lived in his world. But really, that is right, isn't it? If he is good and just, it's what he should do. Can you also see his patience? Not only in sending his own son to die on a cross to take the punishment for our rebellion if we'll trust in him, but then to delay his return to give us a chance to wake up, repent, and be forgiven. Every day, another chance to repent. Every day, another day of God's grace and patience. We love every Sunday having people here exploring the Christian faith for themselves. We love it. And on the one hand, we want to encourage everyone to take all the time they need. Time to ask questions. Time to read the gospel accounts. Time to weigh up the claims of Jesus and make up their own mind. But on the other hand, we want to say, you really need to hurry. There's no guarantee that you'll have tomorrow to figure this out. What does Peter say there in verse 10? But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. When it comes, it will come suddenly. And for those unprepared, unexpectedly. Today may be the last day of human history for all we know. The day of judgment may be circled in God's heavenly calendar for tomorrow or for this afternoon. The time to repent, the time to turn from your sin and to trust in Jesus is right now. Don't drag your feet, don't delay. His delay is his patience to you. The time to repent and bow the knee to Jesus is now. But on closer inspection, this paragraph wasn't written for unbelieving people, was it? Did you notice that? Look more carefully with me at verse 9, would you? Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. You. Who is the you to whom Peter writes? Well, verse 8, it's the beloved. It's the church. The ones particularly being given time to repent here are professing Christians. I wonder, is that a surprise to us? Hey, later on, have a, a read through chapter two of this letter, and you'll see that there were false teachers about, and they were trying to draw Christians away from the Lord Jesus. So in two verse 14, Peter warns that these people have, he says, eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, they entice unsteady souls. Peter's message here to these unsteady souls in danger of being drawn away from the Lord Jesus, forgetting that he's going to return, his message here is that God is giving you a chance to repent. He's giving you a chance to turn back to the kind of life that makes sense in light of Christ's return. I wonder whether any of us here are in that position this morning. We're living in a culture that laughs at the idea of Christ's return. You, you tell the people at your school that you believe that Jesus is coming back, people at your work, how will they reply? How will they respond? Our culture laughs at this idea, and it will encourage you each day to have as much fun as you can without fear of consequence. Christian believer, are you wobbling on it? Are you wavering? Are you in danger of being enticed? Where are we living as though Christ isn't coming back? Where are we beginning to tolerate and nurture sin? Where are we in danger of falling away from Christ? The Lord's delay is not slowness, it's patience. He's giving us time to repent. And having repented to make Thirdly and finally, his priorities, our own. Thirdly, pursue God's priorities, holiness and godliness. This is verses 11 to 13. And God's priorities for us as we wait for the return of the Lord are spelled out there for us in verse 11. Have a look with me. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Holiness. 
as you wait for the day of Christ, make it your top priority to live a life set apart from sin. Live a life that stands out in the world. Live differently from those around you at school or at work. Be holy. Godliness. Make it your daily ambition to become as much like God as you can possibly be. That is, in your moral conduct, in your behavior, in your thinking, pursue the kinds of things that form God's character. Be godly. And notice with me how Peter connects this to the day of the Lord. Verse 12, in this way we wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God. A Christ's return is to be a powerful motivator in living a holy and a godly life. Because for the Christian, holiness and godliness and righteousness are our destiny. Do you see that in verse 13? The new world Jesus will bring when the day finally comes, new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Uh, we are uh, here at Duke Street, an international family. Uh, several of us here moved to the UK from overseas. I, have, I haven't ever lived for an extended period outside of the UK, but I would imagine that uh, moving to a different country tests where you feel you belong. And I suppose you have a choice. Oh, will you do your best to hold on to the language and the customs and the habits of the culture of the country you've left behind? Perfectly understandable. Or try instead to adapt to the country to which you've moved. What will your priority be? Now, when it comes to the Christian life, the answer is simple. In everything we do and think and say, we're to adapt to the country, to the world still to come. Our heavenly home, verse 13, in which righteousness dwells. Notice that's the thing that Peter wants us to know about this world to come. We often focus, don't we, on the amazing truth that the world to come will be suffering free. No more hospitals or care homes or funeral directors. It will be wonderful. But the focus here is, is that the world to come will be sin-free. No more prisons or punishment or penitence. No more repentance, I suppose, in one sense, because no one in that world will ever do anything for which they need to repent. The world to come will be completely sin-free, and so will its citizens those washed and changed by the blood of the Lord Jesus, fully and finally transformed by the power of God. And in this sense, the day to come will do what the flood couldn't do. You know, back in Genesis 6 and 7, God washed the world, and so soon the world was polluted with sin again. But when the day of the Lord comes, he will burn human wickedness away for good. Sin will be banished forever, and only holiness and goodness and righteousness will remain. And God's appeal here to us through Peter is this, will you live like it? Remember the day of the Lord and the new world he'll bring and live for it. Remember it, wait for it, hope for it, long for it. Prioritize the kind of life now that will make sense then. Dress, if you like, for the world to come. Be holy, be godly, and speed the coming of the Lord Jesus. Well, this is the next great date on God's calendar, and it's to be the next great date on ours as well. Each day, living for that day and for that world to come. And so may the Lord stir us up to remember his coming and to live holy and godly lives as we wait for his return. Let's pray.